Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for that introduction, Jeff. There is a handout, and I'll be speaking to the handout. Um, I have to give you um, uh, a warning that I'm not licensed to give financial advice, so anything that I say this evening that appeals to you, you've first of all got to speak to a licensed financial advisor before you follow it up. Now, the question is, is the global financial crisis over? My view is that no, it probably is not over, and no one knows for sure when it will be. And what I want to do principally in my presentation this evening is to look at four ways in which the global financial crisis, in fact, could evolve. However, before doing so, let me just talk about three separate ways of thinking about the future. The first way of thinking about the future is prediction. So you obviously made a prediction that you're going to be here this evening. Uh, Jeff has predicted that we're going to have refreshments after the formal proceedings this evening. You've made predictions about what you're going to be doing tomorrow. So prediction is a way, one way of thinking about the future. My favourite example of prediction is a prediction made by Gordon Moore, the found, one of the founders of Intel, still alive, still working hard. Um, 45 years ago, Gordon Moore predicted that the power of computers will double every 18 months or two years and would halve in price every 18 months or two years. Now, at the time that he made the prediction 45 years ago, it didn't seem to be particularly significant because computer power in the world at that time was fairly limited. However, we're now living in an era where the computer power is really beginning to kick in. A good example of doubling power is the story of the invention of the game of chess, that the person who invented the game of chess was to be rewarded by the emperor with anything that he wanted. And being a smart person, he had invented the game of chess, he said to the emperor, well, give me one grain of rice for the first square, two grains of rice for the second, and then four, and just continue to double it along for each of the squares on that board. There are 64 squares, 63 doublings. If the emperor had honoured his promise, he would have to plant the entire surface of the earth, including the oceans, twice over to grow that amount of food. So we're now living in an era then when the doubling power of computers is becoming more and more significant. So one way of thinking about the future is prediction, and a very accurate prediction was made by Gordon Moore. I'm going to come back to the impact of the Gordon Moore prediction a little later in the presentation. But that's one way of thinking about the future, it's prediction. A second way of thinking about the future is preference. In other words, what you would like to see happen, not what is being currently suggested by trend lines on a graph, but what you would like to see. Obviously, the people who designed this university had a vision of what they wanted. I can remember when I used to give uh, talks to the Australia International Independent School, which used to be on Talavera Road. I can remember this time when it was just basically a few buildings and a lot of grass. And yet, and that, so that was uh, well over 30 years ago. What we have seen, obviously, is that in the vision of the architects, an expansion of this university. That's their preference. A good example of the role of vision is the way in which the General Marshall at uh, Harvard University after World War II had said that what we need to do is to provide money to Europe to help the rebuilding of Europe. 2% of America's gross national product, 2%, went across to Europe each year to help rebuild Europe. And so that he had a vision of a rebuilt, flourishing Europe, making lots of money, and they would then buy American products. But that was the role of vision in terms of uh, what one would like to see happen. Now, I'm not going to talk about that either. What I'm going to talk about is possible. What could happen? What are the signs of change that are there? It's just that we're not seeing it. Um, in other words, it's a matter of paradigms or worldviews. Um, in other words, it's possible for the, the evidence of something to be present, it's just that we're not seeing it. I'll give you an example of that, which is the story of Nokia and the invention of texting. Nokia is a fine Finnish company, but at the top it's limited. It's run by a group of white male elderly engineers. They know they're limited. And so they have a group of teenage advisors. 
Every prototype that they work on, they give to the teenagers. You've got to retire when you reach the age of 18. They give them to the teenagers and say, is there something here that you think we should be continuing with? And Nokia invented a facility called texting, but they could never get it to work because the old men who run Nokia have got slow, fat fingers. I've got slow, fat fingers. I've never sent a text message either. However, they gave their prototype to the teenagers. Is there something there that we should proceed with? It was a 15-year-old Finnish schoolboy who realised that Nokia had solved the basic problems of 15-year-olds throughout history. How do you invite a girl out for a date? You text her. So he said to Nokia, continue with that experiment. I think you're on to something. This day, 7 billion text messages will be sent around the world. We've only got 6.5 billion people on the planet, and some like me have never sent a text message. But this was a 15-year-old who could see something that, in fact, the old men who invented it could not see. And what I want to explore this evening is based on this notion that there may be signs of change that are out there, it's just that we're not seeing it. And the way that I'm doing it is a technique called scenario planning. Scenario planning was developed originally in the American military. It's now been taken over and used in, in Shell, the oil company. And I'm now currently doing my third PhD and I'm using scenario planning to look at the future of the Uniting Church. So scenario planning is a way of helping us to think about the future. It opens up our frame of reference. It helps us to think about the unthinkable. And I'm going to touch on some of the unthinkable things tonight. Um, it encourages us to look at the same facts, but sometimes from different angles, because there is more than one way of looking at something. And it encourages attention to the long term. The problem with our politicians today is they only think as far as the next election. What we need is some long-term thinking. And that's what I want to provide this evening in terms of where the, the global financial crisis will go. Now, the technique of scenario planning, which is set out on my website, globaldirections.com, the technique of scenario planning means that you end up with either two scenarios or you'll end up with four. You never end up with three because your client always goes for the middle one. So the whole purpose of scenario planning is to get people, as I say, to think about the unthinkable. One of the most famous examples of this from one of our colleagues in the Global Business Network is Clem Sutner in South Africa. In the 1980s, his corporation, the biggest corporation in South Africa, was violating the laws of apartheid. They were having to appoint black people to supervise whites, contrary to apartheid. So his company said, why don't you develop two scenarios looking at the future of South Africa and then go around and talk to the white community about this. Uh, whenever I give this talk about scenario planning and there's a white South African in the audience, the chances are either they've met Clem Sutner or at least they've heard of the talks. Clem Sutner developed two scenarios, the high road and the low road. The high road scenario would be the release of Nelson Mandela, at that time the longest serving political prisoner in the world, the creation of a multiracial electorate in South Africa and the election of Nelson Mandela as the first black president. His wide audiences, obviously, as you can imagine, were outraged at that suggestion. So they said, well, there is a low road. The low road is that we whites are outnumbered by the blacks. They're having children, we're not. They're working in our homes. We could be murdered in our beds at night. Tell us more about the high road scenario. And he was able, through those scenarios, to get white South Africans to think about the unthinkable and get ready for the release of Nelson Mandela. Quite coincidentally, in the year 2001, I was a guest of Annette Liu, the Vice President of Taiwan, at a seminar of Nobel Peace Prize winners, including Mandela and de Klerk. And Mandela, not knowing of my interest in scenario planning, quite spontaneously paid tribute to the work of Clem Suntner because he said that as a result of Clem Suntner's work, it created a window of opportunity for him to then talk to his own conservative white politicians about the need to release Nelson Mandela. 